the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On Sunday morning, we will be rejoicing as we will be adding another little one to God's kingdom. Uh, Gunner Thomas Olson uh, will be joining our congregation through the waters of baptism. So encouraging you uh, as, as part of the congregation that he will be joining just to, to pray for him. Um, I don't know where you'll be Sunday morning at 1030, but you know where he'll be. He'll be right there. Um, and so it's a wonderful gift as we are a community together. But in the meantime, tonight we can skip ahead uh, to page four. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord for the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Testament reading this evening from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, Yahweh Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. 
On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Yahweh will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Yahweh has spoken. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is Yahweh. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of our Lord. We speak together responsively, uh, both Psalm 146 and from Isaiah chapter 61. I will praise Yahweh all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise Yahweh all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. The epistle tonight from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. This is the word of our Lord. And the Holy Gospel this evening, and also our sermon text for the night, is from St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of our Lord. At this time, please rise as we confess together our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the sermon hymn. doing things out of order this weekend on Sunday morning, and I'll actually at that point invite the kids to come forward for the children's message. We're going to, we're going to walk through the parable one more time with the kids, um, the parable that Jesus just told, the parable of the wedding feast. And so we have a, a father who is throwing a wedding feast for his son. Who's the father? God. God the Father. Who's the Son? God the Son, Jesus. Pretty simple so far, right? So the Father's throwing the party for his Son. And we get to the guests, right? The servants go out, they invite the guests. What do the guests do? They don't come. They don't come to the party. And so instead then, um, well, they don't only just not come. I don't know if that was a proper English sentence. They don't just not come. They also, some of them at least, abuse the servants who brought the message. This would be like your mailman comes to your house and you just open up your front door and you just start wailing on him. Right? He just brought you your mail. He just brought you an invitation. But this is what they did. And so then, the king in his anger sends his army and destroys the people to whom he had first invited. He then sends his servants out. The kids won't get this one, but you can get this one. Uh, The text said to the street corner, as we think of that phrase, who do you find on a street corner? Jesus was often said to be hanging out with the prostitutes and the tax collectors, right? Jesus 
in this parable is telling them to go to the least of these, go to everyone else, invite everyone to the feast. Um, And then they come. And then we get this really interesting thing about this one guy who's not supposed to be there apparently, right? Didn't they just invite everyone? And now why, why then is this guy in trouble? And so when we get to the children's message on Sunday, we'll walk through that real quick and I'll, I'll break it down for them. Um, but I wanna, I wanna dive into the, the whole parable and explore it in depth with you tonight as our sermon time together. We're gonna look at it a verse at a time. And again, uh, I'll come out of the ESV, so if you're looking at the, the bulletin in front of you, that's fine. The words will be a little different because that's still the NIV. Um, but that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at this masterful analogy that Jesus tells uh, and see how that unfolds, both in the historical sense that he's telling it, but also in the present tense, which that same present tense as it was in Jesus' day is the same present tense as it is for you and me today, if that makes any sense. So we've got then, like way back in history, we've got Jesus' day, and then we've got our day. Our day and Jesus' day are the same, and then there's still the past tense. So we're going to look at all of that. So Jesus is again, uh, the first verse, again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, Jesus enjoyed doing this. And we can understand why, right? How many of you like to tell stories? There should be more hands up. <laughs> we, <laughs> there's a couple of hands up in the, yeah, there we go. So we like to tell stories. We also like to hear stories. We're a story people. We really, truly are. And that's, in fairness, that's probably how God made us to be, uh, is to enjoy stories, both the telling and the hearing. It would be weird if God made us all to tell stories and none of us enjoyed hearing stories, right? Nobody would listen to anybody else. Anyway, Jesus likes to do this. This is one of his methods. He teaches by telling a story. He takes a story that the hearers in that place will understand because it's culturally relevant to them. He takes that story, but it also has a deeper meaning. It has something else to it that he wants them to understand, that he wants them to learn. Verse two, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. The kingdom of heaven is a common phrase for Matthew. He's the only one that uses it in scripture. The other gospel account writers use the kingdom of God. It's the same thing, Um, but Matthew chooses to use the kingdom of heaven. What he's talking about when he talks about the kingdom of heaven is the family of God. It is the people of God. And so here, the kingdom of heaven is like, that's typically the way that a parable begins. The kingdom of of heaven is like this. So this is what it means, this is what it looks like to be one of God's children. This is what it means to be part of his family, to be part of his promises that lead to everlasting life. This is what it means to be the people of God. This illustration is an illustration about the salvation that you have in Jesus Christ. The wedding feast just that, that phrase, the title of the parable, if you title it, the wedding feast is paradise. I mean, this is, this is the everlasting life that you and I have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the everlasting heavenly feast. For those of you who like to eat, you don't have to raise your hands. Uh, both of my hands would be up. For those of you who like to eat, heaven is often illustrated to us as being an ongoing feast. That all of those who believe in Jesus Christ get to spend forever with him in the new creation. This is paradise. It is also a picture for us now of a father and a son. Of God the father and God the son, as we just said a bit ago. The king, the heavenly father, is throwing a feast for his son Jesus. Verse 3 And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. As I said before, these these things, so so here, these servants are going to have a historical meaning in Jesus' story, and then they're going to have a present meaning for you and me as well. We are going to focus on the past meanings, and when we come to the end of the sermon, we'll double back and we'll do all the present at the same time. So in the past tense of this parable, these are the Old Testament people of the Lord whom the Lord sent to share the message with his people. 
So God made the covenant with Abraham that they would be his people, he would be their God, and God sent various people to them over and over and over again to continue to bring the word to them, to continue to bring this message of life and salvation through God and through a coming Messiah. Who then are the servants? Who are these people that brought the word to God's people? The prophets, very good. Um, It would be debatable if we should lump the priests or even the kings into this class. I'm not sure. They often failed miserably. The prophets failed sometimes too, but the priests and the kings were failing all the time. Um, Who then are the people that have been invited to the wedding feast? What would we call them? Not yet. We'll get to that, the past meaning first. You're skipping ahead. The Israelites, right? The chosen people of God was the nation of Israel. The covenant had been made with them. Remember Abraham, God's covenant was made with them. They are his chosen people, they are his holy nation. Through their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these are the children of God. They're invited. They're invited to be a part of the covenant. They're invited to be part of the kingdom of God. They're invited into that family that never ends. Paradise, the new creation, has been promised to them. But being hard of heart, they reject the promise. Being hard of heart, they reject God himself. They reject the salvation that he offers. Verse four, again he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready, come to the wedding feast. And so despite the rejection of the people, God continues to send his prophets, right? This is why you have so many books in your Bible. (laughs) All those minor prophets and even some of the major prophets, If they'd listened, God would not have had to have continued sending them. But we get, we have five major prophets and we have 12 minor prophets and and those aren't the only ones that God ever sent. God continued to send his good news. God continued to send the invitations over and over again. God even made the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant system so that the people of Israel would have a way of forgiveness. That's what this is for. This stone slab, well in this case granite, but this slab, this rock, they were supposed to slaughter the animals on and the blood of those animals was for the forgiveness of their sins. Forgiveness was had for them. There was an invitation. Verse five, but they paid no attention and went off one to his farm, another to his business, and, and here we have them again and again and again rejecting the invitation. They were too busy. They had work to do. They had other things that were more important than God. We would call that idolatry, whether it was in the form of work or the form of uh, a stone or a wooden idol that they had made for themselves or bought in the marketplace, whether it was in the form of family or friends or hobbies, whatever, It's idolatry when we put anything before the Lord. They had rejected God. Verse six, while the rest seized, his servants treated them shamefully and killed them. And worse yet, they didn't just stop at rejecting. We had a similar parable from Jesus not that long ago where they beat whatever servants the Lord sent to them. And here we see it in this parable also. They proceeded to obliterate any and every good gift God sent their way. And I truly mean any and every good gift. It's not just the prophets that we see beaten and killed. We get to points in the Old Testament where God himself is saying, I hate, I despise the new moon and the Sabbath. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. God made the new moon festival. God made the Sabbath. God made the sacrifices, right? And yet, they have rejected his gifts 
so intensely that he despises even his own gifts that he had given them. The prophets who had been sent to bring God's word to his people met gruesome fates. Many of them did. Um, We don't need to go through the list. We often do that with the disciples. We could do it with the prophets too. Many of them beaten or even killed simply for bringing the message of a Messiah to the people. Verse 7, the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Assyria, Babylon, Persia. The Lord used foreign armies, faithless armies, to bring destruction upon the land, to wipe out the people who had rejected and destroyed his promises. Israel was the first to fall, the northern kingdom, 722 B.C. to the Assyrians. The Judaites, the southern kingdom, fell to Babylon in 587 B.C., Assyria fell to Babylon, Babylon fell to Persia, Persia falls to Greece, Greece falls to Rome, and so forth and so forth. Verse 8, then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. This moment begins the shift in the text. There are moments that you can look throughout your Old Testament and see this. There are moments where it's not just the nation of Israel that gets this chance to be part of the promise, to be a part of the children of God. You can name some. Rahab, right? Ruth, he even has her own book. Naaman, you remember Naaman? having to go down into the the Jordan River and wash himself seven times to be cleansed of his skin disease. Cyrus, name familiar? How about Nebuchadnezzar? He had the invitation. Don't think he took it, but he had it. Verse 9, go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. It's not just the Old Testament, is it? This is a major, major theme of Jesus' earthly ministry. The floodgates have been opened. The Jews rejected the gospel. They rejected the good news of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as their Messiah. And so Jesus himself begins to send his disciples to everyone. We see it already beginning in Jesus' ministry as we have things like the the Samaritan woman at the well, we have the, the centurion who, who simply comes to the Lord and says, my servant is sick. And, and Jesus says, take me to him. And the, servant, the centurion's response is, you don't need to come to my roof. Just say the word and I know it'll happen. And Jesus calls his faith great and heals his servant from afar. That was a Roman, not an Israelite, not a Jew. Jesus in Acts chapter 1, after his ascent, or, sorry, right before his ascension, then instructs his disciples to go and share the good news everywhere. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. The disciples are sent to witness to everyone. Everyone. Verse 10, And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all who they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. That's when it began. That's when the kingdom of God begins to fill itself up with Gentiles, with people not promised the promise of salvation at the time of birth. It is a delightful gift for you and for me, isn't it? Because you and I are Gentiles, and yet we have the promise, and that is truly cherished among us. Verse 11, when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. There was a usurper. Someone snuck into the party. Whether he got in initially by his own claim, by the guy at the the door and, and simply invited himself in, saying he was good enough, or maybe he got in by sneaking in of his own will. We don't hear that Jesus doesn't say that in the parable. But the foundation is the same. In either of those kinds of cases, this man is attempting his own salvation, right? The parable's about salvation. This man, without the wedding garment, is attempting to get there by himself, like the Pharisees. 
to borrow from another of Jesus' parables. These are the ones who would hop the fence so that they can get into the sheep pen and cause havoc for the other sheep. Well, for the sheep. So it is here. I can't tell you exactly who this man is in Jesus' parable. Perhaps it's a reference to the Pharisees, to those who hear the promise of God and instead of believing the promise simply as is, it's a promise, it's a gift, they instead think they have to earn it. And so they go into the party by their own rules, trying to to connive and deceive the others that are at the party. It could also be a reference to Satan himself if we go back farther in time. Verse 12, and he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. God the Father asks a simple question. Without my gift, without my free gift to you, how'd you get in? In the Old Testament, this gift is circumcision. In the New Testament, this gift is baptism. It's as the Apostle Paul said as he was writing to the church in Galatia in the third chapter, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Jesus is the wedding garment. In your baptism, the baptism you never deserved that you could do nothing to earn, God put his son's righteousness on you. You are clothed in the righteousness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the wedding garment. That's the free gift of the Father that he just willingly gave out to all the people that he he sent his servants to. One of them chose to come having rejected the garment. Verse 13, then the king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For the one who rejects the Lord, they are cast out. For the one who thinks that they can earn salvation and that they don't need God, they too are rejected. The place of weeping and gnashing of teeth in scripture is none other than the place that was prepared merely and only for the devil and for his angels. It's hell. And this is a place that was not made for people. The scriptures specifically say that. It was not made for us. Verse 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. You have an invitation in the form of God's word handed to you. You have the free gift of salvation in and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You are clothed in Christ himself. His righteousness unearned by you becomes your righteousness. The son for whom this wedding feast is being celebrated is also the one that we feast upon. Let me say that again. God throws an eternal party for his son, Jesus Christ, his righteous son, Jesus. And Jesus isn't just the son that the party is thrown for. Jesus is also the meal that we eat. Right? It is in his body and in his blood that he shed for you upon the cross that you have the forgiveness of sins. And so we come together as God's people. We come to his table, we come to the altar, and we receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We receive the gift of forgiveness. It is a taste, a foretaste of the feast that is to come, the feast that never ends. When you, when we, as the church, as the bride of Christ, are taken up by Christ our groom, I said at the end we'd tie back in a few present notes on this parable. The servants that are mentioned again and again and again from verses 3 through 10 in the present tense are you. You are the servants. 
You are the people of God who have been given the invitations to go out and give the invitation freely to anyone and everyone that you come across. You, you neither deserve the invitation you received in the first place, nor do you deserve the ability and <laughs> to go out and give that invitation to somebody else. They don't deserve to receive that. And yet God gives it. We don't deserve to come and eat the master's feast. But it's a gift. And it's one that we give to others. And yet, even with this wonderful gift, this delightful, free gift, this invitation that has, has no strings attached, this message that is beyond any comparisons, even when you share that, you will be rejected. Maybe even beaten, perhaps even killed. Simply by sharing the invitation of Jesus with another person, you will invite ridicule and scorn and violence upon yourself. Sometimes those who reject God simply turn away. Sometimes they respond by shedding blood. For these people, one truth remains. The judgment day of the Lord will come and the destruction that they will see on that day will be permanent. As for all who reject the Lord, who reject the heavenly feast, they will find themselves thrown into that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth where they get to spend their time with the devil instead of with the Lord. It will be a sad day for them. But the wedding hall, the wedding hall will be full. It may not always seem like that, there are going to be days on this earth where in your life you lift up your voice with the prophet Elijah wondering why on earth God has left you as the only Christian left. Right? Remember that one? The prophet thought he was alone. That is a lie of the devil. You are never alone. You are surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. And even if you weren't, you are surrounded by Christ himself your heavenly bridegroom, and he will carry you through whatever this world throws at you, which was the message of Paul at the end of our epistle reading to the Philippian people when he said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Our groom will carry us into the gates of heaven itself. We are saved in Christ alone. Amen. We're going to continue with the offering. Uh, we welcome, well, the guests that are here tonight are soon to become members, but we welcome them anyway and wish God's blessings to everyone. prayer list tonight, uh, we're rejoicing. Michelle Griffiths is finally out of the hospital. Uh, nine weeks, I think she told me it ended up being that she was in there. So she is out. Uh, she is uh, moving into an apartment in Rochester, but she's out, and we're, we're happy for that. We are happy for her. Uh, we will pray for continued recovery, um, so both Thanksgiving and continued recovery for Michelle in our prayers tonight. Um, I'm going to say a prayer of blessing to be upon Kevin and Samantha. Kevin Welter, Samantha Slavinsky will be getting married next weekend here at the church. Um, and as we talk about a 
you know, a wedding feast. They, they will enjoy that, that foreshadowing. Different topic, but related, uh, that marriage is to teach us about our, our heavenly marriage, that is our, our groom in heaven, Christ. Marriage is to teach us about that. So they get to, get to partake of the heavenly feast um, in a foreshadowing of what is to come. And so we wish the Lord's blessing upon them. Please rise as we join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that even though we don't deserve your love, you love us always and forever. We thank you for sending the invitation, sending your prophets, sending your son, sending your word that we might know of our salvation in Christ alone. We pray tonight for all the others in this world who don't know you, who have rejected you, who have rejected the invitation, who have rejected the good news. We pray, Lord, that you would soften their hearts, um, open their ears that they may hear, open their eyes that they may see, and, in, and give us courage, give us boldness to continue to deliver the invitation, um, regardless of the cost. We pray tonight for all who are, are continuing to suffer uh, from the various tragedies uh, that we see on such a regular basis. Tonight we want to pray for the, those who are devastated by fire, for those families who have perished, for those who have lost their homes, for those who have, have been separated from all that they knew. Uh, we pray for strength. We pray for, for encouragement. We pray that you would grant the firefighters success in their duties and their vocation of putting out those flames. We pray for, for your help in putting out those flames. We pray for your blessing to be upon Kevin and Samantha, um, that they may indeed cherish the gift of love that you have given to them, um, that they may serve one another, and that they may serve you forevermore. We pray for all who are sick, for all who are hurting. We want to pray tonight for Michelle, uh, rejoicing that she got to go home, rejoicing that she is um, still slowly regaining some strength in her legs. She's beginning to walk um, even though it's, it is now with, with canes and, and still sometimes with a wheelchair, um, she is, she's able to be up and out of bed, and that is, that is wonderful indeed. And we pray, Lord, for your continued healing to be granted to her. We pray for Lyndon Luke as he continues to deal with cancer at this time. We want to pray tonight for, for your missionaries around the world, those who share the invitation. We lift up to you, uh, Pastor John Volrath and the people at Our Savior's Lutheran Church in Iota. We pray that you would bless their move uh, from one building to another. Uh, make that a joyful event in their, their community that gives them a special opportunity to invite others into your kingdom. We pray for, for Vicar Chong Tao Vang as he serves the Hmong people in St. Paul and for Pastor Bob Schultz as he serves at our district office. We lift all these uh, to you, as well as all of your servants around the world who share your wonderful, glorious good news of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we join together in the prayer that your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look upon you with his favor and give to you his peace. <laughs>